Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 224 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is the seventh installment of my Diabetes Pro Tip series with CDE Jenny Smith. Jenny has been living with type 1 diabetes since she was a child, so she has firsthand knowledge of the day-to-day events that affect life with type 1. Jennifer holds a bachelor's degree in human nutrition and biology from the University of Wisconsin. She is a registered and licensed dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, and a certified trainer on most makes and models of insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring systems. Besides helping me here on the podcast, sometimes Jenny works for Integrated Diabetes Services. And if you like the way Jenny thinks about diabetes and you'd like to hire her yourself, you can do that. Go to integrateddiabetes.com. There's also a link in the show notes where you can email Jenny directly. As always, this episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Omnipod, Dexcom, and Dancing for Diabetes. There are links in your show notes and at juiceboxpodcast.com for all the sponsors. But if you'd like to go directly to them, you can go to myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox, dexcom.com forward slash juicebox, or dancing the number four diabetes.com. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical plan or becoming bold with insulin. This is the seventh installment in my series called Diabetes Pro Tips. And if you have not heard episodes one through six, please stop this one now, go back and start at the beginning. These pro tip episodes are designed to work in Congress with each other. You should listen to them in order. However, if you're all caught up, sit back and relax and get ready to listen to Jenny Smith and I talk all about continuous glucose monitors. And as you've become accustomed, the Pro Tip series come out in blocks of three. Right now, there are two other installments available, eight and nine. They're called Bump and Nudge and The Perfect Bolus. What's on our agenda today? We are going to talk about continuous glucose monitors. That's a big topic. It is, right? So I tell a story that I think is going to fit here in this episode. We were in my daughter's endocrinologist visit a long, long time ago, probably a decade ago. And the nurse practitioner asks me, are you going to get one of these CGMs? And that's how new the whole idea was. And I I was like, (laughs) I don't don't know what you're talking about, you know? And so she begins to tell me a story about this 17-year-old kid in the practice who loves M&Ms but can't seem to eat them without a spike. So he gets the Dexcom, which I think back then would have been the 7 Plus maybe 10 years ago. Is that the first one? with Probably the 7. The 7, right? Because I know that in 2006 is when I got my first CGM Mm -hmm. and the 7 was on the market along with whatever came with Medtronic. And then Abbott's Navigator had come out. And that's actually the first CGM that I had. And I, remember, I loved it. I it was that. unbelievably accurate. Yeah, I remember but, that one too. Yeah. So it probably was the seven when mm-hmm. you were considering. So, so there it is. So she's telling us about this thing called Dexcom. I don't know what it is. I don't know what she's talking <laughs> about. The, the, the letter CGM mean nothing to me. It's like Chinese, right? I, I just, I was like, it, it could have been any language except the English. I didn't know what she was talking about. But then she tells me this story and she says that the boy gets the glucose monitor and he goes home to the grocery store and buys those little single serving packs of M&Ms, but he grabs seven of them. And the first day he goes home and he eats the M&Ms as he always would. He puts in his insulin as he always would. And he watches his blood sugar go up and it kind of stays up after that. So the next day he thought, well, okay, I must need more insulin. So he gives himself more insulin and his blood sugar goes up less. So the third day he thought he had it fixed. He's like, this is it. I just need more. But he gives himself more. He barely goes up at all, but then he crashes low later. So -hmm. the kid's like, okay. So the next day, a little sooner, a little less, a little more. And he messes around back and forth, back and forth with this. And then she looks at me. I'll never forget the look on her face because she was astonished, right? And she goes, I saw his graph. He put his insulin in, ate the candy. And his blood sugar never moved. And she's telling me a story about that. And all I could think in my mind was, well, if that's possible with that, then that's possible with anything. Like that's what I left with that feeling of. Like there's information coming back to me 
that can do that. That's amazing because I used to be one of those people. We'd go into the, I don't really show them the pump anymore, but we used to go in and they'd download your data or they'd look at, you know, your boluses and all this stuff and where your blood sugars were. And she'd say to me, Hey, you tested. She, you know, Arden ate lunch at noon and you tested at 1230. She's like, why would you do that? And I said, well, don't you want to know what's happening? Like, oh. like I want to know what's happening. So it was a number of years later that she she said back to me, she goes, I realize now prior to you having a glucose monitor, she's like, you were doing it yourself. Like you were trying right. to act as a glucose monitor. You were figuring out what was happening, which made sense to me back then. My finger sticks prior to CGM on average were about 14 a day. I'd have to say that's where we were too. Because I literally, similar as you, I wanted to know where things were not only before, but especially after because it's a learning piece. Yeah. It's just like the M&Ms. It's how did this work or not work? And what do I need to do to make sure that it works the next time? Because I like this. Right. Or I like to do this kind of exercise or whatever it is. I was so amazed just doing that. Just, you know, it fried my mind back then, like to, to test and go, but, but she went to 300. And then 45 minutes later, she was 340. But then she fell and like all that stuff. It was, it was interesting information. It was valuable, but it wasn't enough. Right. right, right. Like it, it wasn't enough to right. make sense, at least for me. I couldn't make sense of it still. Because you literally, when you do finger sticks, then you have to do the connection of the dots yourself. Yeah, and I couldn't There's do that. nothing in between. I couldn't make that leap. I just couldn't figure out what, like, like, like what you're, like those gaps. Like I couldn't figure out what it was. And it's not Jurassic Park. I couldn't just use frog <laughs> DNA to fill in the gaps, right? Because you see, the gaps, you see right? what happens and they're, they're, you know, they're making babies by themselves and it's just, it's not good, but <laughs> not good. <laughs> you don't want to fill the data in with something unknown is what I'm getting yeah. at. No. So I did as best I could. I heard her story. My goodness. I ran to get a CGM. You know, we got the Dexcom right away. I can still remember sitting in the, we, the endo's office, right. And the, the nurse practitioner put it on her the first time and Arden didn't like it. And I remember it breaking my heart. Like, I remember yeah. thinking like, oh God, did that hurt? Y you know? And, and now, you know, with the G6, Arden, Arden honestly says like, I can't even, I don't feel it at all. Feel it. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it's, but back then, you know, there she was, gosh, I don't know, Little. four or five years old. Right. So I tell you every week, go to dancingfordiabetes.com and you really should support them and check them out on Facebook and Instagram and everything. And a lot of you do, which I appreciate, but I just wanted to do more for them. So in May, I'm actually going down to speak at one of their events. And we were trying to figure out a way that I could help them, you know, fundraise. Here's what we decided. Dancing for Diabetes and I have teamed up to give away to not only the people attending the conference, but to you, the listeners of the Juice Box podcast, an opportunity to speak with me. So if you would like a chance to chat with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be conducting two 45-minute phone calls or Skype, you know, FaceTime, whatever you got as well as one big one-hour call that includes a 30-minute follow-up. So there's three calls in there, two 45-minute calls, one one-hour call that includes a 30-minute follow-up. That's three opportunities to ask me anything you want. Talk about whatever's on your mind. So while I'm at the Dancing for Diabetes event on May 18th, I'm actually going to choose the winners at random before I leave the conference. To have your name included in this opportunity, go to dancingfordiabetes.com and click on the Donate Today button between now and May 17th. There's a suggested donation of $10, but I don't think Dancing for Diabetes is going to get upset if you donate more. And all you have to do is be sure to mention Juicebox in the notes of your donation. Those of you who do not have internet access, although I don't know how you would get this podcast without it, or if you have an inability to make a donation, you can mail your name to Dancing for Diabetes. Go to their website for their contact information. I hope to see everyone at the conference in Orlando, but if you can't make it, this really is a wonderful way to pick my brain. We can talk about the Avengers movie or Brexit, whatever you want. Even, you know, diabetes. There she was, four or five years old, in this little dress, and she's so, like, sitting up on the table and trying to be tough and everything. And, and it wasn't good. Um, but... We stuck with it because of what I was getting back from it. I just found it to be amazing. And now today, right. today I think that if you're listening to this podcast and it is of any value to you, I have to give half of the credit to the Dexcom and the other half of it to Omnipod. Like I, I took those two tools and figured out how to use insulin with them.
But you also have to give yourself a big part of that credit because you took tools. It's like any kind of tool. You could have a hammer as one of the simplest tools that there is. And if you don't put it to use, it's a great tool, but it doesn't do anything else for you except sit there. <laughs> well, you're very kind. I was avoiding saying Seriously. something nice about myself, but let's do that for a second. But let's let's translate <laughs> it out to the people listening. My goal with this podcast is just to be your M&M story, right? Like I want you I want to hand you off tools that you then take home and learn how to become proficient with, right? I'm not I'm not going to stand with you forever. Jenny can't come to your house, right? But we're going to we're going to throw these <laughs> I've been tools. Asked many times. <laughs> Somebody said to me once, "Can you come can you live come with live me?" Can you come live with me for was, a while? I started thinking there might be a number where I'd say yes to that, but I don't know what it right. is exactly. Right. How much would it cost for me to abandon my family? Um, <laughs> and so, guys, I'm leaving. But 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 seriously, I, I genuinely mean that. Like you, you're going to get these tools. You learn how to use them in situations, and before you know it, they work in more and more what you would have called complex or difficult situations is exactly the same thing. When people come to me and say, sure, this is great, but how does this work during hormonal time or during a growth period or during illness or during, you know, when your daughter's playing softball, I always say the same thing, exactly the same way. Those tools work exactly the same way. And if anything, it makes you more comfortable. Of course. Right? Especially when, I mean, we talked already about insulin Mm -hmm. and it's actually, I mean, this tool shows you not only effect of food, but more so how to be more comfortable with insulin use. Yeah. Yep. It does. So so not unlike the first time I thought about an insulin pump and while everyone else was yelling, oh, you won't have to inject so much. I was thinking, oh, I could manipulate the basal insulin. Like that seemed like the exciting yeah. part to me. And with CGM, and you probably have heard people say this before, if you have considered a glucose monitor, But the most exciting thing about a CGM isn't the number that it shows you. I'm sitting here now, Arden's blood sugar is 75. She got insulin for lunch. I'm going to find out when. 47 minutes ago. She was 95, 47 minutes ago when we put the insulin in. She's 75 now. So that's comforting to see that she's 75. But what you don't hear me talking about when I tell you that is that there was a moment when she was 89 diagonal down and she was drifting down, but she wasn't falling that fast. I could see how quickly she was falling. That's the information from the CGM. That's just mind blowing. Sure. She's going down, but she's going down at a speed I'm comfortable with based on the food that I know is going in because that battle's about to start really happening. The food's yep. really going to kick in in a second. I love that she's drifting down at that moment because you know, when lunch hits her, I like, like, if, you know, we've talked about it before. I like the insulin to have momentum. Right. If you think it's about the number, you're misunderstanding the CGM. If you think about the M&M story, you have to know it's about timing and amount. It's about right. speed and direction, right? Like which way is my blood sugar moving and how fast is it going? When you know that, it's everything. It's the difference between treating a 75 blood sugar and leaving it alone. So I right. can I can see right now Arden's blood sugar is steady, which mm-hmm. means I won. Because the you know. trend line is horizontal and her arrow is probably horizontal. And that arrow is still telling you something, right? Like yeah. even being horizontal, it's telling you we're steady. And Dexcom we're gives able. you the breakdown of what that means. Steady could still mean plus or minus a point every five minutes. But pff, great. Right. Do, do you know what I mean? But it's happening so so slowly at that horizontal arrow, they usually say that it's less than a point a minute, right? right. And so, and that's where to bring in that, that angled arrow that you saw with the 80 something blood Mm -hmm. sugar. I mean, had it been angled up or angled down, it's still the same rate of change. Right. It's about one to two points per minute. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Right? right. And so when people talk about, Scott, I don't, you know, I don't understand how you don't count carbs. So here's a, here's a way I don't count carbs. Sure, I go historical. I look at a plate and I say, I think this is 10 units, right? But Arden had pancakes this weekend. Big, homemade, not measured pancakes. And I have a feeling that pancakes are going to be 12 units-ish. So I double her basal rate for an hour and a half, 15 minutes before she gets the pancakes. Her blood sugar is already 78 then. She's coming out of bed. 10 minutes-ish before the food starts. I do the 12-unit bolus, 
but I take out one unit that I've added from the basal, right? So now it's an 11 unit bolus. I extend it out 80% right away, 20% over an hour. Now I'm creating kind of like that blanket of insulin like we talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, if I get it wrong, I adjust. Most times I expect by getting it wrong means I won't even be aggressive enough and I'll have to come back and bump it down again. When I see a diagonal up arrow 30 minutes after pancakes, I say to myself, ooh, I messed this up. Maybe I shouldn't have extended the bolus or maybe I should have put more up front. But anyway, I'm going to bump that arrow back down again. In this situation last weekend, I was so aggressive that I had to bail on the temp basal rate. So about 45 minutes after Arden ate, she was 70, which was fantastic. But I was like, I still have insulin going. I don't need any more, clearly. So mm-hmm. we canceled the temp basal rate. And she rode low forever. I mean, it was it was great. 85, like right in there. Right. Healthy. That's not low. That's he- right. Healthy. She rode healthy. Lower than you. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, I definitely misspoke there. Lower than you would expect yeah. after pancakes. Yep. But, but at a great blood sugar because I was able to use what the CGM was telling me. And what the CGM was telling me was she was starting to drift lower from like 90. And I, and I read that drift as these pancakes are through her now to, to enough of a degree that we shouldn't be going down anymore. Right. All right. So I bail on the temp basil. I don't shut her basil off. I just go back to the regular basil rate. So we're going along like that for hours. I mean, hours and hours and hours. Nothing. There's nothing. Now I know the insulin's gone from the pancakes. Now I know the pancakes are definitely out of her body. And at some point, that arrow kind of diagonals down a little bit. And we were getting ready to go out to the mall, her and her friend. So I said to her, hey, take your vitamins, the little gummy vitamins. They must have like six carbs in them. She pops her vitamins in. We get in the car. The arrow kind of bangs back up a little bit again, right in that 75 area. So we get to the mall and I'm like, okay, I'm going to ride this out to see what happens. Like I'm not panicking here, but we were there for about 20 minutes or so. And I wasn't sure if like the excitement of the shopping was going to make her go up or not. And it didn't. She was walking around and my wife and I left her alone, went and did something else. And I texted her at some point, Hey, I think you should shut your basil off for a half an hour. And she did. And we stayed right at like 80 the whole time she was shopping without the CGM. There's just in my opinion, I don't know how to make any of that happen. Like maybe there's a way, but if there is a way, you're listening to the wrong podcast because I can't quite figure it out. Right, right. So right. I think those CGMs are absolutely stunning. I want to know how you talk about using a glucose monitor with, with your patients. I want to know how you talk about using a glucose monitor with with your patients. One of the big things I usually say when people are really either considering one or they've been using one for a long time, but they may not really be using it to their benefit, let's say, um, they're looking like you kind of alluded to just the number, Mm. right? What's the number? What's the number? Um, They're not learning from it because there certainly is some optimization when you start using a continuous monitor. But of any form of technology, I might have said this before, I mean, if I were to have to choose between a pump or a CGM, I would say, please let me keep my CGM. Right. Right. Because even then, uh, if I had to go back to multiple daily injections, I can micromanage that as long as I know the direction of where things are headed. Mm-hmm. I can, you know, and with a pump, then it just brings in more precision. So using a CGM along with a pump is a, another huge beneficial tool, um, you know, to management. Um, so I, I guess as far as that, it's really helping people to learn what is, what's the benefit of that trend that they're seeing. And I think in the end, many people I find tend to overreact to the trend too, and, you know, oh, my goodness, I, you know, things are going up or oh my, going down. Well, you do have to make you have to make some considerations within that trend then, too, because have you just eaten? Is there a load of insulin here? Have you just exercised all of those variables that could be there? There are reason for some of that trend, that trend, just like the guy with the M&Ms, right? right? He knew something was going on with his M&Ms. He didn't want to be high. So he's like, awesome. I'm going to use this and fiddle with it and figure it out. So, you know, CGMs can give you that 
figuring piece that you don't have with finger sticks alone. I mean, you know, again, doing a million finger sticks before I actually had a CGM per day, I was still missing all of the pieces in between. I I was missing when did it start to rise or when did it start to fall? Yeah, I know that I'm like 40 points higher now than I was after I ate my meal, but, but why and where did the rise actually start, right? So th- those are some of the biggest pieces. And I think getting people over the, over the overreaction to the trending is something, it's hard for many people right. um, to be able to try to say, okay, things are rising you ate now, let's do some Mm self-experimentation. Let's see, um, you know, is this happening today around 80% of your most common foods, which most people have about 20 to 25 foods that are pretty common for them to eat over and over. Use your CGM to your advantage. That's 85% of your management then is figuring out. And that's the reason that you have outside of not let's say carb counting in the real sense of doing it, you have a sense just based on the meal because you've done it so much. You can say this should probably be about 12 units or that's more about five units. I mean, uh, ginger actually does the same thing. Mm. She doesn't really carb count truly. She's like this green apple that I eat every morning with peanut butter takes two units. Yeah. You know, um, and using a CGM, then I think that's the biggest thing for management is is the figuring that it allows. Yeah. So I think that you hear a lot of people in the beginning talk about like that anxiety, right? There was a huge concern in the beginning of CGM. A lot of old school people in the, in the diabetes space were like, this is going to make people crazy. They're just going to stare at that thing all the time. And that probably did happen to some people. But Again, it's it's like I say all the time, like if you're looking at what's happening to your blood sugar and thinking of it as a mistake, that's your mistake, right? It should be like, let me experience this. Let me see what this is. Let me see what happens when I put the insulin in here versus in there. And that quickly died down. I, I You quickly heard even some of the more ardent, hmm, I don't know what to call them, but naysayers calm down after a while, you, you know, right. and saw the value in it. I thought the most important thing was to explain to people that it's not just an alarm for when you're low. And I use that phrase in any time I speak somewhere on this podcast, I say, look, if you're looking at your CGM as a don't die alarm, you're making a huge mistake. Right. It, is, it, is the, it is the very least of what it does. And so, I mean, it's cool that it tells you, oh my God, oh my God, your blood sugar is getting really low, really fast. Right. Like, that's amazing. Don't get me wrong. It's going to, it's going to help you. You can't turn one of those alarms off that it's always there, no matter how much you hate yeah. that, <laughs> that noise. It's, it's there. The FDA <laughs> tells them, "Look, under fifty-five, we're gonna bang, and, we're gonna bang an alarm in people's ears, and there's <laughs> nothing they can do about it." And fair, fair, right? But right. if that's what you're looking at it as, it's incredibly short-sighted. When people say to me all the time, "Like Arden's tolerances are, her low alarm is set at seventy, and on my phone, her high alarm is one twenty. On her phone, it's one thirty. So mm-hmm. I like to have a if she's raising up, I like to be able to think about it for a couple of minutes before I involve her in the conversation. Sure. I don't want her beeping at 120, right? But people say, "Oh, it must beep all the time. It must be beeping constantly." And I'm like, "No, it never beeps." And that's actually how Don't worry, I'll get back to my thought about moving down the high Dexcom alarm after these messages from Omnipod and Dexcom. Let's start first with Omnipod, the tubeless insulin pump that Arden has been using since she was four years old, over a decade now. Choosing Omnipod all of those years ago was, and remains to this day, one of the best diabetes decisions that my family has ever made, and I'd like to tell you why. With Omnipod, you do not have to disconnect for activity. With a tube pump, you'll have to take your pump off to play soccer or to go swimming, to take a shower, you know, and if you're an adult and you're having adult time, You might want to take it off for that too, but not Omnipod. Omnipod is always with you. And why is that important? Because you're always getting your basal insulin. It's a completely underappreciated idea. But when you take your pump off for a half an hour, an hour, two hours to go play a sport, you're not getting insulin. And sure, while you're running around, it might seem like, oh, this is fine. But eventually you're going to experience a high blood sugar from that. Getting a constant flow of background insulin is incredibly important. 
and only Omnipod allows you to wear their device throughout your life without having to take it off for any of the, you know, activities that you enjoy so much. I want you to go to myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox or to the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com. You can do that today and absolutely for free and with zero obligation. Omnipod will send you out a pod experience kit, a free demo of the pod that you can actually hold, feel, touch, keep it in your hand, see what it is, and then wear it. You get to test drive it before you buy. It's a non-working pod, don't worry. It doesn't have insulin in it or a, you know, a cannula or anything like that, but it's an exact replica of what you'll be wearing. So you can feel the weight and the size and decide for yourself if you'd like to try it. MyOmnipod.com forward slash juice box. Now on to Dexcom. The Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor is, without a doubt, the Cadillac of Continuous Glucose Monitors. Everything you hear me talk about on this podcast is predicated on the data and information that comes back from Arden's Dexcom G6. We don't need a big long ad for this. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Get started right now. You need to see what direction your blood sugar is going and how fast it's getting there. And you want to be able to see your loved ones remotely with an Android or iPhone. Come on. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Get going today. If you've been hesitant, please trust me when I tell you there's absolutely no reason to not move forward with Dexcom. There are links for all of the advertisers at juiceboxpodcast.com or in the show notes of the podcast app that you're listening to right now. I implore you, don't wait another second. Go tubeless with Omnipod, get the information you need from Dexcom, and support Dancing for Diabetes. It must be beeping constantly. And I'm like, no, it never beeps. And that's actually how the kind of this way that we talk about doing this here, this being fluid, it it it, it makes diabetes a very much a very much a smaller part of your day because you're not thinking about it. Because when it does beep, you know, oh, it's trying to leave this tight range, I'll just bump it back down again. Right. When you put that threshold up at four hundred, because you're like, I don't want to hear this thing beep. Well, that means that by the time you think to look at it two hours later and your blood sugar is 280, right now you've you're- missed it. Yeah. And now you've all, all this mistimed insulin. Now you're putting in a bunch of insulin to bring it down. You're insulin resistant, so it doesn't work as well. Suddenly, you're going to be low later. Later, you'll feed the low. You won't have yep. the nerve of the bolus. You get on the roller coaster. I'd rather know now. I talk about it in a million different ways. I open bills I don't think I can pay on day one because I want to know what they are, right? Um, I want to know when her blood sugar is trying to go over 120. And if you do that, there's a great episode way back in the podcast with um, a scientist from Dexcom. There was a study done. The lower you lower your high alarm on your CGM, the lower your A1C goes. Yeah. Because you react sooner with less insulin, stopping a rise, and staving off a future low because you're only Mm -hmm. using a tiny bit of insulin. We talked about it before. You're going to listen through these things again. They're going to make total sense to you. Um. I want to address when people say, well, I don't want to wear a bunch of stuff. You know, some it, some adults just don't want to wear things. That's fine. But I hear a lot of parents, I don't want to look at her. I don't want to look at him and see him attached to something. I don't. He's not a robot. He's not like that kind of stuff. Arden hated that CGM the first day she put it on, right? And I wouldn't think she thinks twice about it anymore. Not right. even a little bit. She rolled, right. out the, she rolled out the door this morning for school. In a pair of leggings, you can see her CGM on her hip. She doesn't care. She's wearing right. a top that doesn't go all the way down to her to her belt. Her, her, her Omnipod <laughs> right. is sticking out like in that gap of space on her belly. She doesn't think twice about it. You can make those things normal, and and they right. they will be, you know, at some point. So, I don't know. For me, CGM is about reacting, and and instead of you know appropriately I, reacting right. rather than. Rather than being, you're being proactive, really. Mm-hmm. If you have a CGM, you can be proactive um, rather than having to always be reactive at the, like you said, have your CGM set at 400 and you're finally seeing it at 280 because you're not feeling the greatest. You could have been proactive well above or well ahead of that. Right. 
And that proactiveness, by the way, takes less time and less of yeah. your involvement than it does to be 280 and fighting with it for hours after right. that. It seems, it seems counterintuitive because people say to me all the time, you must be so involved all the time. And I'm like, man, I don't think about diabetes for more than about 10 minutes a day. You know, like on the really bad days, 20 minutes. But but I'm not mired down in it. Like there's no hand wringing in my house all day long, like staring at big numbers, wondering when they're going to come down. Are they going to make lows? We just don't have that. Right. I mean, don't get – everyone should – I'm generalizing to make my point. It happens sometimes, right? Yeah. But But as a, a day-to-day idea, it is not something that occurs here. Mm-hmm. And I, if you've heard me speak somewhere – in my slide presentation, there's a picture of uh, Muhammad Ali standing over top of uh, someone he's just knocked out. And I always start that part by going, has anyone ever been in a fist fight? And inevitably, it's always a little kid who's like, I have, <laughs> like, like off into the background. <laughs> and I was like, well, you shouldn't hit people. But, but, but you know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, you, you want to act. Like, like we talk about you want to react, but really you want to be able to act be first, right? You want right. to make a decision first because – Besides stopping an arrow, there's the concept of cause and effect. Correct. Right? And there's this idea that, you know, people always run around yelling, well, that's just diabetes. Every time something happens, they don't understand that was just diabetes. And I always say that when you're saying, well, that's just diabetes, what you really mean is, I don't know how to use insulin correctly. Right. Right, right. And so your blood sugar doesn't go up to 400 because the diabetes fairy tapped you on the head. Like there's a reason. I don't know what it is maybe. You might not Mm -hmm. know what it is, but there's a reason. So at the very least, if you act first, then with some some confidence, you can say that what happened next was a result of your action. Right. At least you're not always covering your face in defense, like a a boxer who just can't can't get a punch in anymore, right? Diabetes is not pummeling you in the face. You, You maybe you hit it too hard. Maybe you end up with a 65 you didn't mean to, but at least you know, wow, I put that insulin in here and I got to 65. Next time I'll use less. Next time I'll do my pre-bolus five minutes shorter. Whatever it ends up being, I don't know, right? Right. But but I'm a big fan of acting first and then taking that feedback and making a better decision next time with it. Absolutely. And that's why I think it's, it's, it's when you're, especially if you're new to CGM or starting out sort of over with a CGM or you haven't used it consistently on a day-to-day basis because you have felt more frustrated about it. Mm-hmm. I think if you get it down to some basics of use to begin with, yes. and like you said, kind of tighten up those targets, even if it's just a short time period, you can designate and say, okay, for the next seven days, I'm going to have my targets set the high alert for 130 and the low alert set for maybe 70 or even 80 if you're hypo, you know, hypo unaware or you just really worried or whatever about the lower end because tightening it up helps but also then fitting in more of your more more of your regular habits mm-hmm. in that testing time period your typical foods the things that you like to eat for breakfast or lunch or for dinner or for snacks because if you're committing to using something by applying it to your body and you know, being a robot, <laughs> you know, essentially. In for a penny, I, in for a pound. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. If you're committing to using it, then get everything that you should be getting out of using yeah. it. And there's, right? a, there's a way to start. Like, in my opinion, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in what you think, but I think that when you first have a CGM on and you're accustomed to wearing it, finally, you know what this information means. The first thing you do is you get your basal right. Yeah. Like, like to me, it's basal first. Make sure your basal's right. And I tell people all the time, if you haven't had insulin or food for three or so hours and your blood sugar is not 85, your basal's not right. And mm-hmm. so and so, if you're 180 or 200, shoot lower. I don't like, don't shoot for 85 right away. Shoot for lower and keep kind of just cranking it down and cranking it down. After you've got your basal in a situation where you're staying pretty stable most of the time without getting low, that's then you can start thinking about pre-bolus. And right. then and then the CGM can really help you with that too. If I'm 120 and I haven't had food or insulin for hours, when I put in f- some insulin here, how soon before I start seeing a diagonal arrow? Is it 10 minutes, 15, 20? Some people say a half an hour. Everybody's number is different. So once your basal's right and you can trust the cause and effect that I've bolus now and it took 15 minutes, let's say, for my blood sugar to start going down, 
within reason, trust that that's probably your pre-bolus, 15 minutes, mm-hmm. right? When your mm-hmm. blood sugar is in range. Now, keep in mind, if your blood sugar is higher, you'll be more insulin resistant. That pre-bolus time won't be the same. But but for, right. the, but for the sake of the conversation, now you have your basal right. Now you know your pre-bolus time. Now you can start using insulin and being a little more aggressive with it. I've put a pre-bolus yeah. in. I'm 90 diagonal down. I've started to eat. My blood sugar shot up. Now here's where the CGM becomes incredibly helpful. So you've, you've got your insulin in, you've eaten, but you're going up. Are you going up like a, a sharp, right, a sharp or... incline, right? Or is it what I call the um, prices, right? You know, the prices might, the, um, the, the, what, which, which is it the minor, the, the climber, the guy's like, and he, 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 yes, yes, right? yes. and he's got the pick in his hand and he's going back and forth and it's, and it's this very gentle grade that goes on forever. And you watch it the whole time going, Oh, he's going to stop. He's going to stop. He's going to stop. Oh, he'll definitely stop. There's no way he's going to fall off the edge. It's not going to happen through the whole thing. And it just keeps going. That's that CGM line that it tricks you. Because you keep thinking it's not on a, cr- a crazy incline. I'm not shooting right. up. I'm just climbing. It's going to stop in a minute. Mm-hmm. But no, it's not. <laughs> and so not most of the time. Most of the time, I find a gentle grade up means not you almost got the amount right. And your pre-ball, There's a deficit, though. Right, right. And your pre is might have been not quite long enough, right? The sharp up is a complete... I don't. I, I just thought the curse, but it's a complete cluster, right? Right? Like you have yeah. not, you didn't have nearly enough pre bolus, and you did not use nearly enough food. So right. there was nothing about your bolus that even gave resistance to that carb impact at all. Right. So you can even and more tell- often with that arrow up. More mm. often it's a pre bolus, especially if you are using a ratio for your carbs and counting your carbs and whatnot. Most often, if you have a pretty significant quick straight up or double up arrow yeah. within 30 minutes, 45 minutes of a meal, right. there's a deficit there and or the deficit is more because you did not pre mm-hmm. There wasn't time like that tug of war between the insulin that you said, yep. you know, in a podcast before, there was not enough time to let insulin get the upper hand. Yeah, right. And I'll tell you that that exact situation, that scenario you're describing, that taught me how to over Mm-hmm. So one, the first time I put in insulin and her blood sugar started to shoot up, I just made the leap. I was like, I missed big time. And I didn't just put in like another half unit. Like I crushed it. I, I was like, I'm going to stop these hours. If I have to feed them later, I will. But I'm not going to let this blood sugar go up like this. And so I realized a meal that I thought was going to take five units with no pre-bolus needed eight units. And so – that taught me in the future when I don't have time to pre bolus, I'll just give eight units for the five unit meal because I, I can create that action of insulin and overpower this even without a pre bolus if I use too much. It's a little more, I call it like that's definitely more of a pro level tip kind of a situation. I'm like, you're, you're more, of a, more of a diabetes ninja once you're doing stuff like that. I, I, I hold that up with the same ideas after you've had a 32 low. And you start coming back up again and you bolus, like when you're 50 diagonal up, like you're a ninja at that point. You're just like, right. You're right, like, right. yeah, I need a lot yeah. more because I know I ate 60 grams of carb and I really only needed like 15 or right, whatever right. it and was. When you start knowing how much insulin to bolus to overcome not pre-bolusing. Again, you've been at this a while, but I learned that from the Dexcom. Like yeah. I never would have like, so, you know, when you see those arrows flying up, not it's not woe is me time, right? It's what is happening. Like what mm-hmm. what could I do next time? Overbolusing is an incredible tool. So and overbolusing in the way that you're doing it is very. I think we talked about this before. We probably did. is it's actually what John Walsh from Pumping Insulin he calls it a super, super bolus, bolus, right? Right, and he does it in a little bit more of a calculated way. Mm-hmm. He says, you know, you take the bolus that's suggested by your pump for the food that you're going to eat, or the the calculated. Let's say you said, okay, she needs five units for this all the time. Well, today there's no time to pre bolus, and usually you would have done a twenty minute pre bolus for that five units. Mm-hmm. Okay, he says you're then going to take the insulin and basal that's running behind that meal for two hours. And you're going to actually add it on to that five units or whatever your pump is suggesting. So maybe if your basal is running at a unit an hour, that's two units of extra insulin. Mm -hmm. You're going to pop that on top of the suggested bolus, but then behind the scenes, and you probably do this a lot too, with that heavier bolus up front, you're like, 
eh, I'm probably going to need to watch and do a temp basal decrease for a little bit after because I know that this is too much in the end result, right? We don't want to cause a low. He says to start by just taking the basal down to zero for about two hours. Yeah. And then evaluating. I've got people who use it and say, eh, you know, I, I tried it. The super bowl is part of it works, but I don't need to turn my basal completely off. Mm-hmm. I only need to do a 50% basal instead of 100% off. Yes. And that's where the Dexcom again comes in yes. incredibly handy. You need it when you need it. You don't when you don't. Right. And then I, I consider that idea trading basal for bolus. Like there, yeah. there are times where I think, oh, Arden's, you know, basal rate's 1.4 an hour. I just bolus a unit and a half. Listen, there's going to be a moment, Right. There's a moment for everybody, and yeah. there is going to be a moment where you see the arrow up, put in the insulin, five seconds later, the arrow flattens right. out, and you go, oh, my God, I didn't need that insulin, right? right. That's when I'll trade the basal for the balls. Right. Just you can cut, always say, cut, it cut off. the basal off. Exactly. Yep. But do you know that? Do you know that if you don't have a CGM? You no, don't. No, you I don't know when know that, that transition was happening, right? If you had none and you were very aggressive about just finger sticking, and you were like, oh, my gosh. You know, 20 minutes ago it was here and now it's like 50 points higher. I have to slam this with more insulin. Awesome. But if you're not willing to do finger sticks, then like every 20 minutes after that to see where things are going, you never know when that horizontal is coming or when a downtrend is coming either. Yep. I am right now texting Arden while you and I are talking. So what I say, it has now been an hour and 12 minutes since she got her bolus for her food. I got a little... um. I don't. I, I didn't panic, but because you and I were talking and I could see what was happening, I shut off her ex- the, the the very tail end of her extended bolus and her temp basal. Yep. And now she's 105 diagonal up. I'm bolusing that because I'm putting in the insulin that I bailed on from the extended bolus yeah. and the basal. I I should have trusted myself, right? And so instead, I'm putting it back again. Yeah. And I will stop this diagonal up arrow around. 115, 120. She'll float there for a while. We'll come back down. I expect her to be 85 by like an hour and 45 minutes from now. And the interesting thing about that too is what you're saying in in terms of her management. And I know her A1C has been like in the 5%. For a long time. You know, yeah. for a long time. But the bigger beyond um, that, and we had a whole, we had a whole, we did a whole long podcast about mm. A1C and kind of what that all means, right? right? But I think bringing in to the fact here CGM translates into that CGM because what we're really hoping for is more gentle rolling hills within our target rather than these major rises and falls of a roller coaster. And if you start to analyze your data in CGM, Mm -hmm. you can actually start then to be able to say, okay, I need to tighten things up here. I've got an awesome looking A1C But I have a huge what's called standard deviation, which speaks to the variability between highs and lows, right? So you may have this awesome looking A1C, but if you're going up and down and you look like a big jagged, you know, roller coaster or mountain range, that's not helpful. Your standard deviation value should actually be low, which means the variance between the highs and lows are also more gentle. Rolling, rolling, rolling. rolling. Right. And the way I found to say that to people is that if you were... 350 and then 60 and then 350 and then 60, all you're doing is tricking the A1C test. If Absolutely. it comes back and tells you, hey, you have an average A1C of seven, which you do when you average 60 and 350 again, but you also have a, you're also not living in a healthy way in any specific way. So don't let no. that number fool you. Um, right. And Jenny's right. There is an episode called All About A1C that she and I did probably more than a year or so ago. Yeah. And I'll, I'll link it in the show notes so you can find it. But, um, I have Arden's last five days and her, her, let's see, her average blood sugar over the last five days has been 114. She's been in range 56% of the time, which probably seems low, except that her range is from 70 to 120. Mm -hmm. That's another thing you need to be careful of when you look at these reports. If you have your high set at 300 and your low set at 60 and you tell me I'm in range 100% of the time, well... Right. Oh, sure, sure you are. Yeah. I mean, good. <laughs> but right, what's right, the yeah. standard deviation within that time and right, range? Right. What What is that? And standard deviation is just a simple mathematical idea that I didn't understand in school and still don't understand now. But it's a basic, right? It's, a, it's an average. Is it an average right. of... Maybe it's a mean. I don't know. See, I didn't pay attention to math. You know, it's funny. You were talking about Walsh earlier, talking about like all these ideas about like Overbowl, his Super Bowl is. 
and I call it over bolusing. And when I think about it, all I think about is more. Like the word more oh. just pops into my head. More insulin. Right. And uh, well, he's more. over there like with his college degree being like, what you want to do is for two hours and this and this. I'm like, more. Right, right. But you've also figured out, I mean, your more is not a dangerous more. It's not a random you, more, no. You, it's not a random. You've figured it out in your, you know, this is your diabetes may vary. Mm-hmm. You've figured it out in di- in Arden's diabetes, right. you know how much more to give. It's not like you're slamming in five more units. You're like, she needs based on experience about a unit more, yeah. or she needs based on experience, two units more based on what went in, what has transpired up mm-hmm. to this point. People, so, people who listen to the podcast know that if this wasn't a special episode called diabetes pro tip, continuous glucose monitor, I would just call <laughs> it Roger Moore because <laughs> You have no idea how many times I hear from people. They're like, could you just make the title something about what's in it? I'm like, no, I can't. That's not fun at all. <laughs> so, um, I, I want to talk for a second about what happens when you get your brand new shiny Dexcom on and it tells you your blood sugar is 90, but then you test with your meter and your meter says your blood sugar is 140. And you go, I don't know which one of these things to believe. So I think it's important to note that a CGM is – measuring interstitial fluid. Correct. Your meter is measuring your blood. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Both of them have an FDA requirement of only being within 20% of range. So if, if a meter says your blood sugar is a hundred, it could very easily be 80 or 120 or somewhere between 80 and 120. As people living with type one diabetes in the two thousands, you're going to have to accept this is pretty much the best we have right now and not to make yourself mental. So imagine that your CGM tells you you're 100, but it's off by 20% high. So you're really 120. And your meter says you're 140, but it's really off by 20% low. So you're really 120. They both agree the numbers you're seeing don't agree. You cannot spend a ton of time being upset about that. No. You have to pick something and believe in it. And I know that's crazy, but... I tell people all the time, there's there's somebody online who's like, look at my meter says this and my Dexcom says this. And I'm like, you're holding a brand new Dexcom G6 in your hand and a meter that was made 12 years ago. And you're telling me I believe the meter. And I always ask him the same thing. Why did you decide to believe the meter over the CGM? Is it because you had it longer? Because it's testing blood and that seems like something that's more accurate to you? Like what is the random thought your brain has had that's made you decide that one of these is more accurate than the other one? Which do you, I test sometimes when I don't, when I'm not sure. So really, I mean, blood glucose is the first line of glucose change. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, you see it there first. Interstitial glucose follows blood glucose. And so with those random, you know, differences, most often I would say people on G5 and G6, for the most part, have pretty good accuracy. Mm -hmm. Finger stick to actual CGM. Where I think a lot of discrepancy can honestly come in is from a finger stick value of, let's say it's telling you 140, mm-hmm. right? And you're looking at your CGM and it's 100. Well, as we kind of started out saying, it's not about the number on the CGM. It's about the trend. Right, right. And like you do very often, you're saying, okay, now there's a trend going up. You know, you just bolus what you missed giving before because you started to see a trend up. Well, her finger stick might actually be reflecting a higher glucose than what the CGM is showing right now because, again, glucose changes first in your bloodstream. And so CGM is going to lag, especially in those time periods of more significant glucose change, Mm -hmm. such as after food or after or during exercise. That, That can be a varying time. So finger stick 140, your CGM is trending up or you've got an angled arrow heading up and it's telling you you're 102 and you're like, huh, what do I do about this? The CGM just hasn't met yet the glucose value in the bloodstream. It will catch up. Right. It will. It's just that it hasn't gotten there yet because really if you think about the way that glucose sort of moves in a simplified form, it moves out of the bloodstream, sort of has to move through interstitial fluid before it gets to the cells to get absorbed, Mm -hmm. essentially. I mean, that's simplified, but so your, your, your interstitial fluid is also always, for the most part, going to lag, especially in special times like food and movement. And I'll tell you too, and, and to circle back around to the idea of the quality of your meter, 
Arden, well, Arden, yeah. <laughs> right. Ar- Arden's had an Omnipod forever, like since she was four. So she's going to be 15 soon. Point is, that thing's been around a long time. It's got an old freestyle meter in it. Um, they've always been kind of wonky. And now we're using the Contour Next One. It's the little tiny meter that's going to start coming. Most accurate on the market. Yep. So when Omnipod decided to switch over to Dash, which should, you know, you might be listening to this and Dash might be a thing already, but it's about to happen. They're going to offer you a free Contour Next One meter to come with it. So I've been using it for a few months to get my head around it. It's spectacular. It is. Like, what a great, accurate meter. It's absolutely insane. Like, I just, compared to what was in that PDM, it was nuts how much better it was. Well, and this brings up for the people, too, who might still be using a G5 Mm -hmm. or a CGM that requires calibration. What you calibrate with then really makes accuracy on the CGM hold better. Right, right. And and if you're calibrating with a bad meter, say you have a G5 that still asks for calibration and the G5 says it's 90, but you've tested with a 10-year-old meter. It's like, it's not, it's 150. What if you really are 90 and now you're telling the G5, <laughs> everything you think is wrong, you're 150. Oh. But the, the algorithm's like, that's not right. We're 90. Right. And then you <laughs> confuse it and then it, it, and it blows up. And then up it gives and, you three, three question yeah. marks for three hours. And yeah. you're like, God darn and it. You're, and then you go, there's <laughs> something wrong with the CGM. Actually, no, it was you. You, you know, right. you put the wrong information in. And so right. it, it, none of this technology is obviously perfect. Perfect. But mm-hmm. again, I always like to say you're not boiling your urine to find out what your blood sugar is. So you're doing Thankfully. great. Yeah, yeah, right. You're doing yeah, great. Thankfully. I all I can say for sure is we as we kind of come up on the end here, and I'm going to ask you to kind of sum up in a second. But what I can tell you is that, as I've said before, Arden's A1C has been between five two and six two for five solid years, and it's going to be a lot to do with the tools that you hear us talking about here on the podcast and and how I've learned to implement them. But how I learned to implement them was the information coming back to me from Arden's glucose monitor. So if you have an opportunity to get one, and I know they're not covered by everybody's insurance and they can be expensive, but if you can get one, you you absolutely, in my opinion, should. Absolutely, Correct. It will just change your life. So Correct. Yeah. Did I we, 100% agree. Thank yeah. you. Did we forget anything? Because um, at this point, people who listen probably aren't surprised, but... I don't pre-plan these with Jenny. I, she, she put on her headphones. And she goes, what are we talking about? And I'm like, CGM. And she goes, great. And then we just started talking. Um, but again, I like the way these conversations flow. So did I forget anything yeah. that, that is like wildly wrong of me? I don't, said? I don't think so. I, I do think that if, um, I mean, this is just from an education standpoint, your own education with your CGM. If you really need some pointers, I mean, it's helpful to look or ask more of your care team. You know, if you do need some pointers, some some endos and CDEs are really awesome. Some don't know much more than just telling you how to slap it on. Yeah. Um, but look beyond, I mean, because there is there's a wealth of, of, of benefit to knowing. And some of it is self-experimentation. In fact, I think a lot of it's self-experimentation. But if you need some help with looking at things, mm-hmm. I think searching out somebody can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who can look at the graph and just make sense of it in a second. Yeah. I, we've talked about it before. I can, at this point, I can look at someone's three hour graph and go, is this where you put in the insulin? And they're like, how did you know? I'm like, yeah, cause it should have been here and it wasn't enough. And this would have stopped yep. that. And like, it's pretty easy to see after you can see it. Right. It's like those, you know what it's like? It's like those posters that you look at it and you're like, there's somebody tells you it's a tree and it's a sailboat and you stare right. at it long enough and it turns into a tree. I think that's what happens. Like after you look at it long enough, I know people can get scared of the idea of data. I don't like the word because I think it, I think it scares people off. Like you need to understand the data. Well, that sounds scary to me. It does. Right, right. There's a little line on your thing. Okay. That line tries to go in a direction. You look and see where you put the insulin in. You see how harshly the line tried to go in that direction. You make a better decision next time. You know, I think that actually brings in one point that we may have missed is that especially Dexcom does allow you to use event markers. So if you are really wanting more, you know, optimization and you're the only one who can really look at your your lines and your info using the event markers. um, I know in G6 at the at the bottom of your at least your screen on your um, on your phone app, you can just choose events. You can log things like food or exercise or illness or even alcohol and like your your cycle or monthly and all that right. kind of stuff it'll put little marks on your actual trend graph 
and that way you can make more sense of the um if you're again the one that's really trying to look back for what did, what happened why did it happen you don't have to remember that i ate lunch at 11:30 you can just right. say food and maybe right. the amount of carbs and, and make a note about what the food was right and that helps you when you look back see again yeah. that's well more way better thought out than i can ever be but that makes a lot of sense and that's why you're here you're the you're the smart part of this conversation so- I'm the chit chatty <laughs> part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, we're we're both important for reasons. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, okay, I think you have to go in a couple of minutes, right? So I, I do. I'm gonna yeah. let you go now and say goodbye. Don't forget, you can hire Jenny Smith to help you with your type one diabetes at integrateddiabetes.com. There's a link in your show notes that will allow you to generate an email right to Jenny. It's magic. Thank you, Dexcom, Omnipod, and Dancing for Diabetes for sponsoring the Juice Box podcast. I cannot tell you how much your support means. Don't forget that when this episode went up, two other Diabetes Pro Tip episodes went up along with it. You're looking for Bump and Nudge and the Perfect Bolus. There will be more episodes with Jenny coming up next month. And programming note, next week, I'll be talking with Katie. You might not know who Katie is, but Katie is one of the people who is key right there in the middle of the DIY looping world. Katie and I are going to talk about the new looping option with Omnipod, which by the way, I think I'm going to try.